Um, my name is Kai Cook, and I gonna, I'm with the University of Utah, and I'm the immediate past president of the Society for Technology and Anesthesia. And I'm going to open up um, our line of speakers with kind of a high-level talk, kind of setting the stage on anesthesia technology. And, and I'm claiming that uh, we can see the future with uh, anesthesia technology. Um, I do have a few conflicts of interest. I'm a stockholder of Draeger. From my time when I was working for them, I'm also a consultant to Edwards. And so if you talk about the future, um, you better um, take uh, note of what Niels Bohr said, that prediction is really difficult, especially about the future. And one approach may be to, to look a little bit into the past and note how anesthesia technology follows this classic sigmoidal innovation curve, right? We had a slow start in the early 20th century, and, and we had a really amazing progress and amazing um, new technologies coming out in the 70s and 80s. And, and then over the last decade or so, it seems as if things have plateaued a little bit. You, you guys, uh, uh, most of your drugs are, are generic now. Um, we haven't seen a major development as far as sensors go on the order of the pulse oximeter in the 80s or the entitled CO2 monitor. And so you may, may say we're maybe in a little bit of a, pa of a plateau here. But then, um, Conventional classic innovation theory says, well, every time you do have these plateaus, that's exactly the time when new things emerge. That's when the small startups are out there trying to disrupt and um, create a new paradigm for you. And uh, in, in anesthesia technology, I, I would uh, pose that uh, we have uh, three drivers uh, driving this. Uh, for one, healthcare is changing itself. Um, we have new ways of innovation. And then also, of course, technologies are changing quite a bit. Uh, it's been a few years ago, but Dr. Um, Michael Porter from the Harvard Business Review um, said that healthcare and healthcare, the days of business as usual, are over. We're, we're moving from um, uh, maximizing value, we're moving to maximizing value for patients, and um, we need a fun fundamentally new strategy. A little bit uh, more recent, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers put out a white, pa white paper where they said uh, the U.S. health industry is undergoing seismic changes. It has to do with uh, a focus on consumers and on decentralization, of course, new technologies and, and internet technologies, uh, again, volume to value and then wellness and health management. And consider this, um, if you look at the Fortune 50 companies, um, 42 of those, 84%, um, do offer healthcare products. And uh, about three quarters of those are actually new entrants from areas that have already undergone this paradigm shift, this, this disruptive change, uh, such as uh, retail and um, finance and energy. And they're now into healthcare and trying to, to innovate that place as well. Um, we innovate differently, right? So traditionally in academia, it's all about publications and grants and awards, and it's very centric on faculty. Um, those are the traditional elements. And now new things come into focus, and new things are added to that, new elements, and, and that has something to do with translation. We're creating spin-offs to translate our research results into, into products that, that impact patient care, um, and it's student and patient focused. So to the old culture of knowledge, uh, now we also have the culture of impact that is, that is combined with that. Um, I spent quite a bit of time in industry on research and development, and in the, in, in the former days, the traditional approach was to have your R&D department have very high walls. Nobody, you should not let anybody look into your cards, um, otherwise the competitors may steal your ideas and are much faster, and, and so we had these very firm boundaries for the funnel. Um, research projects were initiated largely in-house and then progressed into products, product development. And then in the early 2000s, uh, we, we moved to a concept called open innovation, where um, the boundary of the firm became more um, uh, permeable, if you will. Uh, research projects may have come from the outside. You may have had started some research projects and then you outsourced it to other groups. Um, and, and including products or including um, developing new products for new markets. And then more recently even, um, we now completely dissolve the boundaries and we have uh, a big network of all the different stakeholders. And um, for example, my old company, uh, Draeger, they just renamed their R&D department and it's called Connect and Develop now. 
um, because they realize that uh, you have to connect with all sorts of stakeholders outside and, and work together with smaller companies to really get innovation off the ground. So if prediction is very difficult, you may also uh, take some solace from, from a quote from William Gibson where he said, well, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And that's especially true in our field, um, anesthesia technology, which continues to be the strongest driver and enabler, pioneer of change, and so on. And the main reason is we have reasonably small or slow innovation cycles, right? Your average um, patient monitor or anesthesia machine is going to stay there for about seven to ten years in the OR before you replace it. That's that's really slow compared to other stuff. Um, if you compare it, for example, to our mobile phones that we're carrying around, how did they look 10 years ago? Right? Very, very different. And, but yet, if you go into the OR, um, you still have products that are that, are that old. And that creates um, obsolescence ch challenges. Right? Uh, you constantly need to re-engineer your existing product line. But it also allows us to see the future. And one of the reasons for that is we have reasonably small volumes. Right? So um, some company with uh, 60 to 70 percent global market share in anesthesia machines may be very happy if they sell 20 or 30,000 more machines per year. Um, again, compare that to your iPhone. The iPhone 7 sold over a million um, phones on the first weekend when it was launched. Right? So nobody will make um, specialized components for your medical devices. Nobody's going to make a specialized screen for your monitor or a power supply or other microprocessor. And so you're relying on standard components from industries that are changing much faster than we do. Um, and these industries, of course, also uh, help. Um, they're driving technologies and they're also driving expectations. Right? So users nowadays, they expect very much ease of use. They, they want process support, they want interoperability, and all of these things are coming from outside, outside of medical devices, outside of anesthesia technology, and they're driving, they're driving our changes. Um, and so Eric uh, Topol, in his latest book, is, is saying that uh, um, in medicine, we're way behind the other industries. The other industries have already moved on to the fourth industrial revolution, all about AI and big data and, and robotics. And we do hear about those things, right? We just had some excellent talks yesterday about that, for example. But we don't see it in mainstream, um, in mainstream operating rooms yet. And so here are some of the latest and greatest technologies, some of which, which we'll be hear about in, in the other talks. Um, we, we have information technology, so keywords are big data, blockchains, um, artificial intelligence, deep learning, connectivity, interoperability. Um, we have all the omics that are going to be changing our field. Uh, we have virtual augmented reality. Um, Clyde Matawa is going to talk about that. The whole. Um, issue of what do we do with all the data that's coming from our wearables, right? In our mobile phones, uh, we have gesture control, automation, augmentation. When you hear about these things, the, the reaction is uh, either total fascination and, you know, really not seeing any limitations or very skeptical. So there's a huge range of, of responses to, to these new technologies, and that's what we're trying to unpack. Right? So this panel is all about um, trying to figure out where in that innovation hype cycle are we um, in the different technologies. Are we on the upswing there from innovation trigger starting, or are we already at the peak of inflated expectations, or are we already disillusioned and, and we're just beginning the slope of enlightenment? And so um, that really concludes my piece of the talk, and I would like